Uh, I want to welcome you to a uh, panel that we're calling Artwork in the 1632 series. And I need to explain what this is and isn't because we are having another panel that is called Artists and Musicians in the 1632 universe. And what that's about, that's actually a literary panel. That one is about how do you depict artists and musicians in a world where early 17th century, where people from the late 20th century have arrived, and they've not only arrived with themselves, they've arrived with their books. And even though it's a small rural town, it's got plenty of books. Uh, there's a high school library, there's a town library, and individual people uh, have books. And um, there is actually, this is surreal, in the town of Mannington that I used as the model for Granville, there is a couple that has an entire building. It's a reconverted garage that they turned into a library and they have thousands of books in there. I mean, small towns have lots of books, believe me. And among those books are gonna be a certain number of art books and, and, and music. And all of a sudden artists and composers in the 1630s are going to discover themselves what they did in the future. Rembrandt is a young man. Rubens is a very well-established artist. Um, there are musicians. The Bach family has already started. So what that panel is dealing with is, is, is what's the psychological, and that means storytelling aspect, so to speak, of how artists and musicians react to, I mean, what do you do if you're an artist and you look at a painting that you did 300 and some odd years in the future. Do you do it again? Or do you say, no, hell with it, I'm going to do something completely different? It's, a, it's something of a quandary. And on the other side, if you're somebody who comes in from the 20th century, and of course, there were no great artists and composers in that small town, but there were people quite talented. How do you react to it? Anyway, that's what that panel is about. This panel is not about that. This is a, I don't know how to put it. Um, the more hoity-toity literary types don't really like to accept how much of fiction is like making sausage. Um, they sort of, you know, don't want to look at that. But the fact of the matter is that whatever else literature is, it is entertainment first and foremost, whatever else it does. If it can do more than that, that's great. And, and authors try to do that. But if you're boring your readers, then you know, you're know you not really imparting anything to them because they're closing a book and going and doing something else. So part of the art of putting on something like the 1632 series is we have woven art into it from the very beginning. and. It started with, with Bain Books, which was the original publisher and still, you know, the main commercial big publisher, um, has artists who do cover illustrations. In the case of the 1632 series, except for the very first three books, the artist who's done all the covers for the books is Tom Kidd. And, and now Tom is gonna have his own show uh, for the series because, you know, to do and display uh, the various covers he's done in the process by which he works. What what Laura and Garrett and I are going to do is something a little different. Garrett has been with the series since, God, Garrett, how long? When, when did you start? 2003? Oh, Lord. It's been forever, something like that, yeah. Yeah, it was way, way back. I, I used to know. Yeah, and <laughs> it was a long time ago. Producing was a Gazette 17 or something. Something like that. We started producing the Grantville Gazette magazine around 2003, I think. Um, and it originally got started because um, after writing the first novel, 1632, and then David Weber and I wrote the next one, 1633, and we then produced an anthology of fiction called Ring of Fire. And it was unusual in that, so there was so much fan involved in the series that, that what we did was 
produce an unusual anthology. We set half of it aside in, in the traditional way that it, where you commission stories from established authors. But we left the other half open for submissions from fans who wanted to write what amount of the fan fiction, except we pay them for it. Um, and we got over 100 yeah. stories submitted, and we wound up buying nine of them, as I recall. Um, and Garrett, you didn't have one that early, I don't think. I'm trying to remember when your first story. What was your? I didn't have one that early, but I think I was in the second wave. Second, okay. It was called bird watching. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Pam Miller saga. Yeah. So, what then happened was, people kept writing this fan fiction in in in, in Bain's bars and Bain books has a, a, a website uh, in its website. It has a discussion area for for fans, and the, the fiction kept being written, and some of it was damn good. So at that point, I proposed to Jim Bain, who was then the, the owner and publisher of Bain Books, that I asked him how would he feel about launching an electronic magazine devoted to the 1632 series. And he thought the idea was interesting, but he didn't, he said he, he just didn't want to have to deal with running a magazine as well as everything else he's doing. But he said, but if you want to do it, Eric, he said, I'll lend you the money. You can set one up and, and then just pay me back and keep going. And that's what we did. Um, and the magazine was quite successful enough. I was able to pay him back pretty quickly. Um, the first, I believe it was 10 issues in a magazine, if I remember correctly, we did on a kind of, I'll call it a semi-pro basis. We weren't paying professional rates for the stories. We were paying about two cents a word. Um, and it wasn't until May of 2007 that we started, that we decided to, to turn the Granville Gazette into a fully professional magazine, which it has been ever since. It's produced on a regular schedule, comes out every other, every other month. Uh, it pays rates to the uh, authors that are accepted as professional rates by Science Fiction Writers Association. Uh, in fact, it's accepted by CIFO as a qualifying venue if you want to become a member. Um, and from very early on, I don't remember exactly when, I think right from the beginning, we incorporated some art in the magazine, if I remember right. But oh, early, good. I think so. But very early on, Garrett became our art director. Well, and she hated doing it. I'm sorry? <laughs> she hated doing it. So she, <laughs> she saw that I was handy with Photoshop and said, you want a job? And I said, I don't <laughs> Well, anyway, about right. Garrett's done it ever since, and um, it's not only that he does the covers of the magazine, but he does artwork all the way through it. And so I, I'm going to, in a bit, I want Garrett to describe exactly how he does it, what he does, and hopefully be able to show some examples of his work. Sure, sure. Now. What happened, just to continue the story, is that, that we were publishing a lot of, you can't call it fan fiction because people were being paid professional rights for it. Um, but most of the writers in the 1632 series started as fans. That's true of most of my co-authors of novels. Um, a few of them, like David Weber and Chuck Gann and Walter Hunt, were established writers but most of them were not. Most of them came in as fans and learned to write within the framework of the 1632 series. And some of them have gone on to have their own careers since then. Um, the problem we ran into, what would happen is that after a while, Bain would start, would take, we'd take stories from the magazine, which is only electronic, and then Bain would publish an anthology of the best stories we'd collected from a certain number of issues. And Bain would issue it as both uh, as hardcovers, mass market paperbacks, and electronic books. Um, the problem we ran into was that the magazine accepts a lot of long serialized stories. We're one of the few magazines that does that. And the problem is that a story of that length you can't put in an anthology because it would just take up too much of the space and suck up all the oxygen. And so those stories just didn't get reissued, they, you know, which is too bad because some of them are very, very good. Um, so eventually it occurred, I say, I'd say it occurred to me, except I'm sure it occurred to me talking to friends, you know, other people 
involved, but we decided, well, let's just launch our own publishing house. Um, you know, just to be able to publish these longer stories that, that can, you know, that can't be reissued by Bay Book. So that's what we did. And that was starting about seven, eight years ago, I think, if I remember right. And the first few volumes we did occasionally, I, much as we did with the first issues of the magazine, it was sort of done sort of on a semi pro basis. Um, I've forgotten what royalties I was paying, but um, the covers, I think Garrett, I think you're the one who put together covers was basically. Uh, really not really. I, I put some, I made some logos and stuff. But yeah. Those okay. Are by the wayside now. But the covers, if you were to go back and find those collector's items, which is what they are, those very first editions of the books, they'd have these red covers with a picture in the middle that was sometime, I think most oh. of them. Yeah, I made mean, I mean those. I remember you know, those. Yeah, I think they were probably <laughs> taken from the public domain. We put it on there. Yeah. And then what happened was that after a while, it dawned on us that, well, we actually have a publishing house, so there's no reason we have to restrict it to 1632 books. We could publish anything we wanted to. So we started issuing a few titles that weren't 1632. And at that point, which was about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, I decided I really should start taking this more seriously. Um, and I knew damn good and well that what that was going to require was I was going to have to come up with some money and get a real artist to do the covers because if you're going to do it seriously, you've got to have professional artwork. There's no way around it. And I, I, am, I am not a painter. No, 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 no. Aaron, Aaron is not himself what you call an artist. What he is a, is an art. He's a designer, basically. Graphic designer, yeah. He's a graphic designer, yeah. He's I'm not an artist. Pretty good, but I'm not really a painter. Yeah. Now, by just good luck, at a convention in Denver, <laughs> wasn't it, Laura? Yes, it was in Denver. At a convention I wound up to in Denver. Uh, I ran into Laura Gibbons. Now, I had known Laura from years back because. When I was the editor of Jim Bain's Universe magazine, we incorporated artwork in the magazine. And Laura was one of the main artists I used. And I'd had no contact with her since uh, Bain's Universe closed in 2010. And by now, seven years, something like that has gone by. Uh, no, eight years, because we're now up to 2018. And I met Laura at the convention and I asked her, I said, do you do book covers? And she said, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> a book cover for me and she said sure so i commissioned her to do a book cover and i'm trying to remember which was the lord do you remember which was the first book you yes did? i do actually let me show it just a second oh great yeah please do uh, let's see can you see it not yet you okay. better understand we're all kind oh, yeah. of we're all fairly new zoomers oh yes <laughs> Okay, let me get rid of this a second, see what we're doing. Okay, share screen. There it is. Okay. And share. Oh, there, there we go. go. That's there the it is. That's it. No shift. For, that's right. I forgot. That was no shift for Tronkabar. Now, just to make this book had actually come, this was not brand new. This book had been out for about Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's one of the first books we published. Um, it has been out for a couple, three years. And, you know, I did sold okay. Um, but Laura did that cover. I really liked it. And, and so I had her do more covers. And what happened was that most of our sales go through Amazon or Ring of Fire Press. Um, about a little less than 90% of the income comes from Amazon. Most of the rest comes from our own website. Some comes from Bain Books, which also distributes it. Um, but up until that point, the income of the publishing house had been a really good month for us. We'd get about $2,000 in. That'd be a really good month that we didn't have too many of those. Uh, most of them are more around 1000 sometimes less. And then Laura starts doing her covers, and there's a two-month lag in Amazon to the time the book, you, you, you earn the money in the time they pay you. Um, 
and I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. And all of a sudden, at the end of the month, the money shows up in my account. And all of a sudden, we had made almost six thousand dollars. And that's the difference that artwork makes: is that it it catches people's attention. They look at it, and the first time, really pay attention to the book and consider it. The next month, we made twelve thousand. And then from there, it started dropping down, but it's never bottomed out. It, it went down to about six thousand, now it's back up again. And that was the point at which Ring of Fire Press became really a professional uh, publishing house. That's when I said, okay, we're gonna really take this seriously. We got professional proofreaders, copy editors, artists, you know, you spend money. I mean, but what you get at the end of it is a genuinely professionally produced novel. And um, most of our sales are electronic, but it's a surprising amount we sell print on demand. It surprised me. It, it's about 25% of our income, which is way higher than I thought it would be. Oh, I, don't, I didn't think so, because, yeah. No, no, it is. So, I mean, a lot of people are getting the actual paper book and they're seeing Laura's wonderful artwork. But Laura's not our only artist. There are some other artists that use, but she does at least 90% of our covers. Um, oh, she's been our community artist from, from, for two and a half years now. Just like Garrett's been the art director and art designer for the magazine uh, from time immemorial, it seems. Yeah, oh, like my, I, my beard wasn't white back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it was, you know, this is the first time I've ever actually seen Garrett. We've known each other for 17 years, but he lives oh, in you Rally. Really? How? Yeah, you met me at Rally. Oh, did I? Reconstruction, yeah. Oh, that I wasn't very, I wasn't very memorable, so don't feel bad. Uh, there was one time you came. Uh, Garrett lives in Thailand. But, it's, it's okay. Uh, I, I only made it to one, but I, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you're right. I forgot that. Yes, yes, we did. Move no back. worries. No worries, mate. Anyway, so what we're going to do in, in the time we have is as much as we can, just try to give people a sense of the role that, that, that artwork uh, plays in both producing a magazine as well as, as, as a publishing house. This, by the way, this, this cover behind me is one of the few Laura didn't do. Um, this was done by um, uh, Larry Dixon, who's a, um, a, an old friend of mine. And, uh, um, I normally, to be honest, could not afford Larry Dixon, but he, he did it as a favor. Uh, and it's this wonder, you can't really see it that well, it's this wonderful cover of a demon uh, being caught in the headlights of a van that is, it's a really good book. You should you should buy it, you can get it here and, and, uh, and, and read it. But it's a cross between author and history and fantasy and it's, uh, if you like stories that involve really bright teenagers um, who managed to figure out ways to get along with demons, you will like this book and the sequels. And there are going to be more sequels. Anyway, uh, Laura, uh, Garrett, do you have stuff you can show? I do. I do. Good. Why don't we start with that and then we'll come back to Laura. So, okay. Well, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this to work now. Uh, screen. Share. Okay. Can that move? Okay, there we go. All right. So what I'll start with, I'll try to keep this brief. You tell me when I've gone on too long, if I do. <clears throat> uh, one of the popular things people always like is covers that have some kind of a 17th century painting that's been manipulated to have something from the 20th century. So this is uh, the King of England reading Cromwell's England. And he's not very, <laughs> not very happy about it. <laughs> uh, I usually try to throw some humor in. I'm a humorist. So uh, this is Cromwell's England. It's, it's, thank you. It's a, it's a history book that either does or doesn't exist. I just made one up. And uh, so that's a very unhappy English king. That was a William? I can't, I can't, I can't remember now. So then let me see if I can uh, find another one here like that. I think we already saw the girl playing. Oh, no, here we go. Here is an alchemist with a light up globe, which uh, people seemed to like. Oh, I've got you guys out in the middle here. All right. I'm still working on this. 
so uh, I just don't, I don't know. I just thought it was fun. It looked, it looked pretty to me. Then we'll go to here. Uh, what is that? I'll just, oh, oh, that's her again. This is actually a real laptop from 1993. It's like a ThinkPad. I, I have to be careful because there are people watching who, who get that stuff. Like that wasn't there when, oh, yeah. when the fire happened. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest, hardest thing to do sometimes is make sure it's right for both eras. Exactly. And that's something I, I struggle with every issue. Uh, I'll, I'll say this now, the biggest job I do isn't actually creating the artwork in Photoshop. It's doing the research. I read every story and then I have to go out and Google and find images that work. And then I have to make sure they're public domain or, or orphaned or close. And uh, it's a big job. That's what takes my, my uh, most of my time is getting all the, the, the source material. I'll say, I mean, you do a terrific job of it. I mean, I've noticed over the years, it's, it's in the way that I don't, <laughs> this may strike people as heretical, but I don't read every kind of story that comes in the magazine when it comes No. Oh, horror. Well, horror. Part of that is because I was a magazine editor and there were times I was ready to strangle Jim Bain because even though he knew better because he'd been the editor of Galaxy, but Jim had his quirks and he kept being a backseat driver and the proper role of a publisher of a magazine is, is two. You hire or fire the editor and you pay the bills and that's it. A magazine does not belong to the publisher. It's the editor's magazine. If you don't like what the editor is doing, you can fire them and, and, and or her and get a different one. But they run the magazine. It has to be that way or you're going to have a mush of a magazine. And so I, it was uh, uh, Cheryl Detwell at the very beginning and then Cheryl had a, um, had a terrible stroke and she died prematurely and then Paula Goodlett mm -hmm. took it over for years and then Walt Boys now has, has been the editor of the Gazette for several years now. And um, they have always been the ones that, that they run the magazine. So where I come in is when we put together the anthologies. That's where what will happen is the editor and some other readers will sift through all the stories and they'll recommend to me the ones they think should be considered for an anthology. And then I make the final selection out of those. But what that means is I have to go into the magazine and I have to copy then and paste them into stories. And what I'm pasting in is all of Garrett's art, which I then have to get rid of so that I can read the story and turn it into a text manuscript that they books will accept. Oh, I didn't know you got stuck with that job. Wow. Yeah. But but it means I get to look at it, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, and what strikes me all the time is how, it, it's obvious how much research you do and how much work you put into it, because it, it, <laughs> you. Not just, these are not just image snipped from nowhere and slapped in with no rhyme or reason. They make sense. I mean, they have some context of the story, and, and um, uh, I don't even want to think how you find that stuff because it, you know, it's I mean, hours of Google. Like, <laughs> stuff. We couldn't possibly afford to do it any other way, yeah. but that's not that easy to do if you've never tried to do it. So anyway, sorry for that digression. But do you have, Garrett? Do you have any examples? What you showed us so far covers. Do you have any examples of the illustrations you put inside the magazine? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the thing that I brought to the magazine that I was always pretty pleased about were the title banners. So uh, every story I do one of these, this is a, a David Carrico story that was about jazz coming through the Ring of Fire. And what I tried to do, I found, I, I work, I love fonts. So I tried to find a font of the time that would that would be evocative of that era of that scene. So actually from a, an old uh, record. And then I found a, a typical jazz uh, studio and I used Photoshop uh, various filters to create this kind of old record album effect, which I think worked out pretty good. So let's see here. Now I've got, I've moved you guys somewhere. I'm just gonna minus us for now. And okay, here's a, let's do, I'm, now I gotta find, now I'm scrolling through, find another one. 
Okay, here we go. This one was kind of fun. Uh, snowbound. What I did here was I tried to evoke the snow in the font. So I found a font that I liked that I thought worked for it. And then I have the, it looks like kind of freshly fallen snow. I think it does anyway. So that's another example. Then, uh, oh, this is a very recent one. This is from a very recent David character and Mark Houston story. And without, I hope I don't spoil it too much. If you haven't read it, put your hands over your ears and go, no, 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 no. Uh, in the story, that's a big spoiler. Well, there are women who have been captured by a, uh, by a prostitution den and they're prisoners there basically. And the, the, one of the themes is they all wanted to be ballerinas. So they came to Magdeburg to do that and uh, ended up here. So I found this image, I thought, wow, that, that gets that story better than, than I could think how. I'm, and I, I'm kind of pleased with this one. They're, they're all lying on the ground and have their heads down and they, they look like they've been traumatized. So yeah. Well, it's also very much a ballerina feel. Yeah, they are ballerinas. These are yeah. ballerinas. It was a public domain photo. And then I used the filters to make them blue and, and sad looking. And, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with this one. This one uh, really, I think, turned out pretty good. Some, you know, they're not all hits, you know, guys. Sometimes I <laughs> make stuff that when it's all done, I just go, oh, whoa. <laughs> I wish I had more time. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Oh, here, overflow. Another, another case of using a font with an image to make an effect. Obviously, beer, which is dear to my heart. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Okay, a little bit about how I work. We'll go to this one. Uh, yet another David Carrico story. Uh, these characters are from Greek legend and they were featured or someone like them was in the story. So why I found a Greek looking font, obviously you can find fonts for anything pretty much. And these two guys, well, it's an Amazon and a, and a man are fighting, were very much like the images that he was describing in the story. But before this happened, I started with this. That was that getting rid of all the stuff and cleaning this up and, and making it look right was about three hours of Photoshop. Oh my God. Yeah. And I had to do things like rebuild parts of uh, their feet and stuff. Like here, I had to go through and take the spear out and get rid of all this and then, and then just really clean it up. So that happens quite often and that's very time consuming. Basically, I'm a Photoshop collage artist. Uh, in this case, I was able to find the whole picture that really worked. Luckily, it was in the public domain. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what else? And another one. Uh, black. Oh, how about phone? Phone is kind of cute. So here's the original piece. Uh, I think it was by Fells of a, of, a, of a merchant. And then what I did was I put him on the phone in Grantville. So I, <laughs> so he's on the phone and I have, I even have, it really worked, it worked out pretty good with the, the position his hands were in. Could you I go back to the original? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so all you had to do was move his hand up a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's tricky too. I think I actually had to make a new hand. Uh, yeah, that was actually, you can find quite a lot of clip uh, of uh, a free art on the internet with different postures. So I had to make him a new hand there. So that's, oh, and here's, um, let's see. Am I going on too long? Is it time for the hook? No, we still, I just want yeah, so to, I just want to make, Laura, make sure, how much time are you going to need for minimum? Oh, oh well, as probably. Long, as long I, as you'll give me, I'm, I'm cool. I don't have a presentation or anything. I was just going to show some covers. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't keep going, Garrett, for another yeah. just few minutes, and then we'll switch over to Laura, and then you know we can always come back. Um, okay. What I wanted now, this is for what I wanted people to get a sense of is what's involved 
in producing, let me back up. I, I'm, we're really proud of this magazine and, and to give people a grasp of how unusual this magazine is. This is to the best of my knowledge and anyone I've ever talked to. This is the only professional magazine in any genre that has been able to keep going even for a few years, much less we've now been in operation for 13 years, based solely and entirely on a literary series. There have been magazines that have been successful, but they've been based on big media properties like, you know, Star Trek or Star Wars. Or there's a magazine that went on for a few years based on the man from uncle. But I do not know of any magazine that has gone on for 13 years on a continuous, unbroken professional basis. And we're still going strong. I mean, you know, we're in fine shape. Um, good. Based That's good on a series, <laughs> at least so far, is purely literary. I mean, there's been no, you know, TV, movie, nothing else. Um, and part of it is that the stories are good. And they really are. But uh, part of it also just the whole presentation of the magazine. It's, it's people open it up and look at, at it. And this, this um, you know, it's electronic. We don't, we don't, we don't do a, um, a paper edition of it. But um, um, people look at this thing and they go through it. And, and this is what they get all the way through from the cover on down all the way through. It's, uh, it's, it's a hell of a magazine. It really is. Um, and, and this is a pitch, by the way, people who have not, not um, you can buy this magazine individually, you can subscribe to it, or what most people actually do is they join the Ring of Fire Club, uh, which for $50 a year, you have access to every issue of the magazine going all the way back to the beginning, which means that basically you have access to what amounts to, uh, we're up to issue 91 now, so that's like 91 books. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, en enough of me patting, well, not just myself. No, oh, good, give it the cell, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so listen, why don't we do this? Laura, why don't you show people some of your stuff? Okay. Now, with Laura is different. Laura is an artist. I mean, no fooling. Now, the one thing, though, is Laura also designs the covers. Most artists don't. Most artists will just do the illustration, and then someone else will design the book cover but Laura does both. Um, in fact, has there ever been any cover you've done that I had someone else? Oh, no, no. Uh, I think you I, designed everything. I do cover. have other publishers who use people for the, you know, for the titles and stuff like that. But, and I say, fine, it's still the same price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> and, I know. Yeah, uh, but mostly I really like being able to, uh, to put in my own, uh, my own titles so that I can compose around it. And I know that I'm not just sort of cramming it up at the, up at the top in this little place and, you know, maybe I'm covering up somebody's face and um, I started. I saw doing... that. I love that. So you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. I can you. tell you were doing it. <laughs> Thank you. I try and to do that too. I, I started doing just titles for a couple of publishers when they had problems with the people who were doing the titles because they were just slapping stuff in and had no artistic sense really. And, uh, you know, and it's not that hard or anything. I had, I had, he had bought a cover from me and had someone put titles on it. And in the top half, he covered up the face of one of the there, there was there's this huntsman very you know strong and virile and this woman on a giant stag and she's looking around like what the heck am i getting into and the titles um guy had covered up her face and yeah. destroyed the whole gag <clears throat> i you know and so i and, and i wrote to the publisher and i said you know i my artwork isn't sacred or i don't think anything like that but you screwed the gag up and, um, and he said, well, can you do better? I said, hell yeah. And <laughs> I've been doing titles for him ever since. <laughs> and that's been about eight years now. So it's a, 
it's a good little extra thing. And yeah, I, I sell a lot of artwork to it too. So it's a good relationship. But what I do with Eric, and by the way, I really want to thank you for the story about how the magazine was, or the publishing house just wasn't doing that good. And then when my cover started, it really doing, it really did good. The only way that I know that my covers are successful usually is that the, the publisher doesn't go belly up. They actually survive. <laughs> Other than that, I get no input. <laughs> I, it's just, oh, well, my covers are good enough that people aren't, aren't, you know, just horrified and going away. But I get very, and most cover artists get very little input from, you know, I like hearing from authors, you know, if they like the cover, sometimes they don't like the cover, and I like hearing that too. Uh, but what, I work in, in much the same way that Garrett does. I, I do um, digital collage, and except instead of finding whole things, I find little bits and pieces. And I've, uh, you know, just going on the internet and I also work with, um, uh, what is it, Dreams, Dreamtime? There, there are several sites that just sell uh, things that are, you know, copyrighted and you pay a little bit to the artist and, and you use uh, their, their picture, not, not the artwork, but just a picture that they've taken. And sometimes it's just, ooh, I like that guy's glasses. I want to use those on a character. Um, and I, that <laughs> I basically right. build the covers from that. Let me uh, show you. Let's get. Let's see some art. Okay. And this is one that I did very recently for Cecilia Holland's yes, yes. Art of the World. Just, just yeah. came out. Yes, just uh, came yeah. out. Yeah, it did. It, it just well it came out, you know. It's been a month now, but uh, not not quite a month. But this is uh, the first book. Cecilia Holland is a a famous, wonderful historical fiction writer, and this is the new novel she just wrote. And it's the first one of hers we published, but we acquired, um, oh gosh, I think it's a total of five books of hers, which we're producing as time goes on. Um, Laura did three different covers for this, which was unusual. We, we don't usually do that many, but I wanted to, uh, um, I, I was really happy that Cecilia agreed to let us publish her. And so I wanted to, but we did three covers for her. And there were, uh, can you show the other two or do you? Um, well, yeah, you know, I can, but they, they don't look like a whole lot because I never really pursued those to the end. Oh, no, I know, I know, I know. Uh, but people get an oh, idea of when I say we, we you did three covers, I mean three completely different ones. They weren't. Very okay, different. let's see. I think that's, let's see, two. Yes, uh, that was one of them. So I'll open that one. Okay, so, and this was another one, and I, I did you know, go into too much detail. I cloned this poor warrior over and over and over and over, <laughs> and over to make a, a Mongol horde. Um, and I thought this was going to come out really cool. It didn't. It, it was just, you know, they were right. Uh, to, of the say, three you know? Everybody agreed this one didn't work. Um, yeah, it just the didn't character work. In the center is the hero. Well, he's one of the central figures in the story. But he's a sort of uh, disgraced Knight Templar. And, and then the other two characters, are, those are the three major characters in the story. But um, I, I know what, what, uh, <laughs> what Laura's trying to do, it just didn't work. Yeah, oh yeah. This was wow. my favorite, this one. Yeah, well, I like the way that I, I guess it. not a dramatic, but um, um, the two I liked were this one and the one that we finally wound up using which is the first one you said. And that's the one we went with. And the reason was because we showed all three to Cecilia. And this is the one that she, I mean, not this one, but the, the first one you showed. Yeah. With the yeah. archer against the map, this one. This is the one that Cecilia liked the most. So let, let me open up the, the original version of that. Uh, so you, I, I can kind of show you the differences. Let's see, yeah. Okay, this is the original version that Cecilia looked at and went, yeah, I like that. This is 
the when I when I did the uh, the warrior, I didn't make up all the little bits about him because uh, it would have taken too long. But I put in a map that I found and just ha found this photo of a guy shooting a bow, and he had on the. There's a lot of really cool Mongol horseman photography out there. I never knew, but there's pages and <laughs> pages of it. They, it's a thing over in that part of the world, I guess, much like cowboy pictures here. And uh, so I got this and like that. So I made it into this, which I, is a little bit more dynamic. And uh, the horse really looks like he's running along. And, and uh, I got to make up my own <laughs> Mongol outfit. And that was way cool. That I don't want to make a Mongol outfit. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, a lot of times, that's one of the things I really most enjoy about doing covers for the 1632 art is it stretches me and lets me do things that I would never do at most publishers. I mean, how yeah. often does a Mongol come up? And uh, <laughs> yeah, even though it's not a 1632 story, it's, it's pretty much a straight historical. Um, but when I do the, the 1632 stories. Let me grab one here a minute. Okay, let's see. Let's try Blood's Call. No, that's not a 1632 story. Um, okay, oh, that's not, yeah, yeah that's no, right. That, that's one of David's um, 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 uh, let's see which one, uh, Danish game. Danish. Danish yeah, game. Danish game. Or da yeah, there we go. And um, so, and, and the one thing that, that I didn't like just about By the way, part, just, just let me say this, I think, if I remember right, was the very first book that we published in Ring of Fire Press a very long time ago, but it, this was a new cover. And uh, yeah. it started selling way better when the <laughs> Well, I, I felt bad that I couldn't find an anachronism to put in and make it fit the story because there was very little about the, the uptimers in it. But even so, I, I really like it as a piece. It's, it's a you really know, good story. Yeah. And the key to it is just the, the expression on the, on, the, on the face of the guy. It's just, uh, it's hard to verbalize it, but I know what, pulls people and, tr and draws them to a cover is, is a scent that there's a story here. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and, and there are different ways an artist can convey that. But the main thing that I think Laura did here, I mean, you know, the background of the ship and all that, that's great, but it's the expression on the guy's face. Yes. That's yes. Just, okay, there's something, this guy's interesting. I mean, he, he obviously thinks, he, I don't know, he's sort of got a kind of sly, amused expression in his face, and, and uh, that cover works. It's, uh, it's a really good cover. And I say that even though Laura violated my first rule of covers, I've become so crass over the years. <laughs> I've written, published so many novels that people ask me, what do I want to see in a cover? And I say, the color red. Uh, because it's guaranteed to draw a reader's eye, and there's no red at all in this cover. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that this was a real early one that I did for you, and I, know, I, I remember when I, I first saw it, saying, "This is great. I like this cover." Yeah, part of me was going, "Oh, well, he wants kind of classical painting-looking things." <laughs> it took a, it took like six, seven covers to kind of go. Ah, so this is what you want. I got you now. I think I, we're both on the same page. And uh, Derek's writing down the color red, the color red. <laughs> yes, well, the color red. <laughs> uh, look, I know that's crude, and, and I have had great covers that didn't have any red in them, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the easy, uh, it's the easy, uh, not Harper's Landing, let's see. Oh, Legion, go to Legions of Pestilence, because we had to work oh. on Oh my God, that, that was, okay, I'll, I'll show you the first version, uh, which is like, eh, <laughs> I, I don't, eh, what's happening? Eh, I don't know. And, but the story was hard to find a, a hook. 
something that I can I can hang it on a character or an event or even I I did one with a with it's a sports car in the story uh, I think it was a um, God I forget what kind of a car but and that was the main character and so I wound up putting that but it has to have a focus and this story I just wasn't finding a focus so um, and then eventually it wound up let's see legions um he just pestilence yeah i think this is what we wound up with and no 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 okay is, no, they, the, the one you wound up with is the one where what we did was you put a, a Wait, microscope, yes. or, um, microscope in his hand it's basically kind of this one but See, I, I tend to keep all the old versions just in case uh, Eric or some or the author or someone goes, you know, that first one that you did, that really is better. <laughs> and so I don't destroy them. It <laughs> uh, takes up a little everything. bit of space, but <laughs> let's see, Legion. Um, is that it? If you show it to me, I'll recognize it. Yes, it actually has a microscope yeah, in it. That's what it was, yeah, yeah. And that kind of, but it should have been, what I should have done, looking back on it, is to have a much tighter view on, on this guy, get rid of the whole staircase thing and, you know, make the, the icky, bleeding muscle uncovered guy bigger too and made it splashier. Well, you know what you could do if you want? Do you have a copy of the uh, cover of Magdeburg Noir? Yeah. Let's take a look yeah. at that, because that's what you did on that one. We, we focused yes. a bit more on the character. Uh, I have everything. Well, I hope so, everything. Let's see. Magdabar. Bar, no, we, did several, we did several different versions of this one. Yes. And yeah. that's, that's more of a... That's yeah, the final the, version. That, that focuses in and, and sort of says, there's a story going on here. Ooh, what's happening? But I'll tell you what the difference is. If we go back to the first version, it was it was more of a focus on the characters. You didn't have the background. Right. And right. I remember telling you, I think you needed more of the background because it it just it wasn't I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's just with that background, the story actually comes more into focus to me. Okay. But this is this is, this is the version that I did with snow. That's right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. a big point is made of it in, in the story, but it's not actually necessary for the illustration. Yeah. To, uh, let's see. Let's see if I've got. Is it a movie? Yeah. I read, as I was reading the stories, I mean, that moment just caught me and I go, that's, it was a, a book of different stories. Um, rather than being a novel. Let's see. Uh, yeah, this was. Yeah, 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 that's it. That was the original, very first version you did. Yeah. And I remember looking at it and liking it, but that's where I remember telling you, I think you need a background because it's just, it's too, it's, yeah. yeah. That just makes it clear, sort of what the that it's. I don't know how to put it. It's, it's having the cathedral in the background. Sort They're of. in a dark, lonely place, and there's no one else around, and it's the middle of the night. And also, that, that's that's you know, the scene. And also, you're not, you know, you're not in a suburb of Phoenix. Um, <laughs> this is true. Uh, do yeah. uh, uh, we, we're almost out of time. So the one I'd like you to show is, I just noticed it is Mark Territory because that's a very recent book we came oh, out. Oh, yeah. And that, that's very different. Yeah. And um, let's it just see. just came out recently and uh, uh, it's a terrific cover. And it's also a really good book. Oh um, yeah! Wow, that's cool. yeah. yeah. It's it's very much it, it's a it's a Bogart movie with a cat as Bogart. Right. <laughs> I thought, oh, I know where I'm going with this, and I wanted to also have a back alley feel, so the the bricks and all like that, but not to detract from the cat. And he's sitting on a dumpster, and there's a there's an old 
you know, shovel or uh, broom in the, in the foreground. And uh, yeah, but it does jump out at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this cover, I get it. There's no color red in it, but. Uh, oh, well, there is. Uh, metal right there. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, hey, before we go, do I have time to show you one more, Eric? Sure, sure. Yes, no. yes, please. Let me get out of this. Uh, are, are you stop okay? Screen sharing, yes. All right, let's see if I can find screen share again. Uh, share. The bottom. There we go. And Ooh. Here we go. <laughs> Is that oh, red enough for you? There you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the technical side of this is this is one where I have a lot of different things happening. I found the hand one place, the dagger another place, the girl another place, yeah. the book came from somewhere else, and the background came from somewhere else. So these are, it's a collage. These are all different bits this, I cut out. That's the way I work as well. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really fun actually. So anyway, I just want to slide that in for fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's interesting oh, because, because of the way, uh, uh, I don't get directly involved with, with Garrett and covers for the reasons I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I stay one hands off with the magazine. I get cranky when people do, so it's okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, I wanted to show one more. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, well, you're welcome to say anything anytime, Eric. Of course, your input is valued. Oh. Tom Corbett, the front cover. No. Cool. Space no, Cadet. Oh, wrong one. Tom Corbett. Love Tom Corbett. Hmm. Well, they, we're, we're reissuing the whole series. Yeah, I, yeah, I wanted to show the the um, the very first cover for for the book. You know, that's the that's the cover for the comics collection that I'm <laughs> that I'm putting together. I, 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 I saw this and I loved it. You yeah. saw uh, you talking about the one standby for Mars? Yeah, I'm looking to where I hid that. Let's see. That's wrong. Uh, half of my time is spent figuring out where the heck I put something. Oh Lord, <laughs> I can't. I can't even get at all my stuff now. It's on all those hard drives, and uh, PCs no longer function, and I really have to dig for it. I wanted to have some really old stuff from the beginning, but I, it's just not available right now. To really dig for it through all the junk. <laughs> Well, I can't find it right right at the moment, but oh wait, wait a second. Uh you got the second book there, Danger in Deep Space. Yeah, yeah. I I I had the sense to to title that folder logically. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel your pain. Anyway, the 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 cover for uh for the first Tom Corbett um standby for Mars is half crimson red all the way <laughs> and eric loved it <laughs> yeah. red red eric loves red well, the, are you talking about the cover the final cover yes well anybody wants to see it they can they can go on the ring of fire press website and and you know it'll be fairly recently and and because it came out in uh uh, September 20th, it came out like three weeks ago. So it'll oh, okay. be up in the, in the new releases section, should be. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, um, the original idea we had was that we would go with the original covers and just touch them up a bit. Um, but, you know, once I saw them again, I had fond memories of them when I read them when I was, you know, like, I don't know how old I was, teenager. And like 13 teenager, not 19. Um, and but then, you know, it's like a lot of things you remember really fondly from way back when, and then you actually see them again, and it's like, hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, or I can do better than this. Uh, <laughs> or I can do way better than this. So I just said to her, no, let's just just do a fresh cover. Um, and that's the one we finally went with. 
Um, we have run over time, actually, um, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But what I wanted to the audience to to see was the, the role and how much of a real role that artwork plays and art design plays in in producing this kind of stuff. It's uh, there's the role of the author and the editor. That's one obviously extremely important side of it. But putting it all together involves the whole thing, and um, it's a lot of fun too. It really is. So anyhow, um, thank you for coming. And I want to thank both Laura and Garrett for. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. It was really fun. Yeah, it was good fun. to meet you, Garrett. Uh, yeah, good to meet you too, Laura. <laughs> so anyway, um, we will have to wrap it up here. I'm afraid we, uh, that we're running out of, of time. But anyway, thanks both of you for coming and thanks to the audience for watching.